That's great. Okay, you're all very welcome. Thank you, everybody, for joining us at this latest Centre for History, History Talks Live talk. Uh, tonight's talk is slightly different. Um, we're delighted to have Sue Jane Taylor with us, who is an artist, um, very important artist who lives near Dornoch, where we have our base at the Centre for History. Um, before I introduce Sue Jane, I'll maybe just do a wee bit of housekeeping. Um, just if you do want to ask a question, there will be an opportunity at the end. You can either unmute your mic and just come in, or you could post it in the chat area, which is to the right of the screen. Um, but Sue Jane will be talking for, I think, 40 minutes or so, something like that. And um, this is being recorded as well, so it would be a helpful resource for afterwards. Anyway, um, I think that's all I need to say at the moment, but I'm going to introduce Sue Jane Taylor now, and it's an absolute pleasure for me to do this. I've known Sue, I've known Sue for quite a long time. Um, she's an extraordinary artist, and she has been active since, I think you could say the late 70s or early 80s, looking through a large part of her career at um, North Sea Energy, and that began with a um, work on the oil industry, but it's moved into other areas as well. Her training has been in London, Stockholm, Aberdeen, various universities there. She's also, I noticed from her CV, had a lot of visiting uh, lectureships in various places. Um, I note somebody has their hand up. I'm not sure if that's because of an issue that I should be reporting, but I think I'll just carry on unless somebody indicates to me otherwise. Um, her publications are a major thing. One I've just been looking at recently is a chapter in this edited volume called Cold Water Oil, which I heartily recommend. Quite impressive. Well, I'm always impressed when I see artists who write their work up as well. For somebody who responds to texts like me, that's that's always a pleasure to see. Um, we've collaborated with Sue Jane quite a lot over the years. She was a co-organizer of a, of a conference we hosted in Dornoch in 2016 called Firths and Fjords, and she played a major part in that, and I was, it was just wonderful to have her um, involvement in that event. So, without much further ado, I'm going to pass over to Sue Jane. I will just explain that Sue's um, broadband is not tremendous. That is one of the factors of living in the Highlands. So, what is going to happen is I'm going to share her presentation. I will switch my video off to stop being an annoyance while this is happening and mute myself. Um, but once the presentation's over, I'll be back to chair the questions session. So if you're okay, Sue Jane, while we're admiring your fantastic background and that enigmatic <laughs> jacket behind you, I'll pass over to you and let you start your talk. So thank you very much. And it's a great privilege that you're speaking to us tonight. Thank you. Uh, first of all, unfortunately, I've got a, a... Uh, stop my video because of my broadband speed, but you can hear my voice. Um, so welcome to all attending this talk. And thank you, David, for the introduction. I hope I, uh, my talk will live up to your kind words. Um, I want to start off with a quote um, relating to all our lives which I recently read in an article, and it all made sense to me. Um, the 20th century US writer, Flannery O'Connor, said that anyone who survived their childhood has enough material to last a lifetime. Next slide, please, David. And this quote certainly resonates and relates to my own childhood experiences, which have strongly influenced my adulthood and professional art practice. Next slide, thank you. Born and brought up in Manlochy on the Black Isle, it was a fairly remote part of the Eastern Highlands during my childhood in the 1960s and early 70s. And it was a fairly idyllic one, uh, run running around the countryside with friends and ponies. And for me, um, Inverness was a distant ferry sail away 
and my parents were natives to the area and very much part of the Gaeltach tradition, even although Gaelic was not their first language, it was for some of their parents and certainly their forebears, it was part of their culture. And both my parents served in the, first, the Second World War and my father was fourth generation in running the family shop, taking over from his own father, touring the West Coast mainland, selling the shop's drapery wares in his van. Yet between the 1930s and 60s, massive hydroelectric dams were built in the Highlands, and with it came thousands of transient workers. This brought electricity to our rural areas. And Dunray Nuclear Power Station was built in 1955 in the north coast of Caithness, operating up until 1984. So it seemed that massive new energy industries had already arrived before I was born, with false promises of cheap electricity for all. And I quote here from Professor Ian Stewart relating to hydropower. Thanks to hydropower, every major body of water, every major river in the Scottish Highlands is blocked by dams, diverted into reservoir catchments, and now the levels of those lochs and reservoirs go up and down according to the market pegged to the price of electricity, beautiful and damned. So when I came along, um, the youngest of four siblings, my parents were mature in their years to have children, and I was a 60s baby with a given name to prove it. And we knew almost every car that passed through our village, and if we didn't know who they were, we would try and find out. And during the late 60s, the middle class hippies arrived in their old vans and Morris miners renting out local farm cottages and living the good life. And I wanted to show you some comparison photos of how my village has changed over the years, like all settlements in our modern world, changes directly relating to the advancement of fossil fuel extraction and the massive surge in private car ownership. So in the early 80s, Keswick and Cromarty bridges were built and opened. And I remember my mother, sister and I sailing on the last ferry between North and South Keswick, the Black Isle and Inverness. And my sister and I cried as we knew that was an end of an era. And Manlochy became a thoroughfare for commuter traffic to and from Inverness. So progress brings many convenient changes, but it also has devastating ones too, directly relating to our own family who ran the local shop, which became the first self-service grocery shop for spa franchise on the Black Isle. And Presto Supermarket was built just off the second roundabout over the bridge in Inverness, 10 minutes away. So its lure was too tempting. And when the oil boom hit the Highlands in the early 1970s, the changes to our lives and all around us were immense and irreversible, both socially and geographically. As marked here on the small map, the fabrication yards, Ardesir, east of Inverness, Arnish on the island of Lewis, Western Isles, Kishern on Wester Ross and Nig in Easter Ross were all established, each employing up to 5,000 of a workforce. And Isle of Flotta Oil Terminal Orkney Isles and Sullum Vaux Oil Terminal Shetland Isles were also established, receiving oil and gas by seabed pipelines from the newly operating oil and gas production installations offshore. We had a lot of relations in Cromarty, which is located directly opposite Nig Yard. So we were regular visitors to this town. And at that time, the town's buildings were very run down and dilapidated compared to today. And I remember whilst playing on the green and looking across the firth to Nig, 
with the imagination of a child, believing that alien beasts were being constructed there. The giant steel structures and the banging, echoing noises amplified by the Suta Hills. So in our own village, Newton buses for Nig would pick up the yard's new workforce, locals who left their traditional jobs behind to the lure of learning new trades and wages four or five times more than they were earning. And Ford coupe cars started appearing going up and down our one and only main village street. So in recent history, masses of incomers are not new to the Cromarty Firth, and it seems that this Firth has always been an attraction for maritime activities of all sorts throughout the ages. And in 1907, this Firth welcomed 14,500 men, and with them came 20 torpedo boats, 12 battleships, 6 cruisers, and 2 scout ships. And thousands more were stationed during the First and Second World War years. My father was born in 1914, and he remembered, just remembered, the First World War fleet in the Cromarty Firth and the military service people camping around the Firth throughout these years. And this postcard here illustrates my point. In the distance, one can just make out the three battleships anchored west of Cromarty Town. So this map became the North Sea map from the 1970s, the North Sea Anthropocene maritime map of our age, the age of oil. And on the map, you'll notice Murchison Brent Fields, which I'll talk about, the Beatrice Wind Farm Demonstrator Project, and also the little red star where I am speaking from, where I am live and work near Dornoch. But if you're standing on the beach or sailing on a ship in the North Sea, it looks wide and empty. For spatial planners and policymakers, the opposite is true. The North Sea is one of the most densely used and industrialized seas in the world. It is an energy landscape. And during my undergraduate years at Grey School of Art, Aberdeen, which is located on the outskirts of the city, my higher art education was far removed from the oil and gas industrial activities. Urban and rural, rural landscapes were granite buildings and open countryside and hills. So there was no organised drawing trips to the harbour or encouragement to look at or connect to this industry, Aberdeen being the oil capital of Europe. And as art students, we existed in an unreal bubble to the outside world all around us. Industry and art didn't mix. So, thanks to a commission in, in 1984 by Sterling Shipping Company, Glasgow, while well, I was a recent young art graduate, I sailed out on the Sterling Teal, one of their cargo vessels, supply vessels, for a week visiting oil fields, and this changed my artistic life. Because it, it had all the visual drama for an artist out there, the scale of the man-made constructions, out in the harsh, remote, natural environments, a tough man's machine world versus nature's. And I began to draw in these liminal environments where no other artists had been, and I was allowed a glimpse into the secret world. So the workforce's expansive and colourful PPE, which we all know about now, the personal protection equipment, the clothes that they work to wear, wear to work in capture my imagination from deep sea divers gear to survival suits. And in order to gain access to these installations, one not only had to convince the owners, the oil companies, one needed to gain one offshore ticket vantage card, which means going through survival training 
which most people dread unless you are a fit water enthusiast. And these certificates need to be updated every four years. So in the UK offshore North Sea sector, unlike the offshore Norwegian sector where gender workforce is more balanced, it is a male dominated work environment, military and its rules and regulations. And my first offshore trip was a packed whirlwind day trip to the 40s field. And then my first time staying for a week on board a platform was the ill-fated Piper Arpa almost one year before the disaster of 1988, where the platform exploded and 169 men were killed, still the world's worst oil disaster. And I subsequently went on to sculpt the Piper Alpha Memorial, which was sited at Hazelhead Park, Aberdeen. And my descriptions and experiences of working on this memorial would need a separate talk to describe. So over the years, I have visited many offshore platforms, mostly in the northern North Seas. The general public have always found it hard to grasp and visualize of what goes on out there in the production fields, because these installations represent an aspect of our contemporary age, which many people have not thought about or have tried to ignore, that of the age of oil. And since oil was discovered in the North Sea 50 years ago, this industry's public identity has been predominantly portrayed in cold, hard economic terms, and its image has been very tightly controlled in film and photography. Its production platforms are typically located in remote offshore environments, and this remoteness is reflected in somewhat secretive and hidden corporate identity. For an individual outside this industry, it is extremely difficult to gain access offshore. And I'm often asked how I manage to gain access to these very private environments as I'm often quoted as being an out there artist. The answer is, I, I just don't know. I, it's, it's certainly not been easy. Oil companies seems to, seem to have been born suspicious and it is the nature of the beast. And these man-made metal islands are in parallel artificial worlds, comparable perhaps to a confined futuristic space stations and as an artist, I'm also searching for the source, in the sense, the opposite to Gustave Courbet's La Source de la Lou River painting series in 19th century France. One could describe looking down at the massive well risers soaring out from the sea and up into the platform's belly as the source of our age of oil, soaking up the fossil fuel devil's water from hell and it is our addiction. And compared to other heavy industries, like the shipyards, for example, in the Clyde, Glasgow, and northeast of England, they become part of their cityscape. People worked, breathed, and lived these yards. A whole community culture grew up around them. And when they were gone, romantic, nostalgic reminiscences have taken their place. With the oil and gas industry, people feel disconnected and not part of their lives, even if their partners are working in this industry. And with the removal of these fields in recent years, it is creating nostalgia, reminiscence and heartfelt sadness amongst the offshore workers themselves. And these giant fossil fuel producing metal beasts were their second homes. And at times, I'm a fly on the wall in these remote, extreme environments, privileged to be writing my on-site diaries and drawing my visual experiences. My diaries are an extension of my sketchbooks and visual research, contributing to my final artworks, reminding me of the on-site details, environments and instances with people who I've met and drawn. And as we move into the mature years of the North Sea, 
with the eventual removal of almost all these 400 offshore installations, the decommissioning program has begun. And this represents a shift change in the industry. Existing oil wells are running dry, which makes them uneconomic, leading to new methods of oil and gas extraction, new attitudes towards the natural and social environments, and an emerging large scale offshore renewable energy industry. And my art practice is tracking this change. And to this end, in 2014 to 2016, I recorded the Murchison platform's last months of production, its removal and breakup. And I was one of the last 17 on board experiencing its power shutdown and death. And my lasting Murchison memories are of silence. The only noises came from the sea and the wind and a magical moment in time when nature was given back its space. So what will take their place? Vast offshore wind farms and tidal turbine farms. It's already happening now. The North Sea map will change again from fossil fuel installations to renewables. And this map shows the latest round of licenses for companies from the Scotland County State Scotland just back in January this year in 2022. And these clean energy infrastructures are very different, challenging beasts to draw. They have an air of the present day towering white goddesses and gods of the seas. Yet renewable wind industry is also corporately and controlled in the UK. And it too is a private industry and owes much of its development offshore to the oil and gas industry. So it is also, especially onshore and rural areas, such as the Highlands, a very visible industry because of the large scale of its installations and thus has received much negative publicity, including some resentment amongst the communities towards private estates and landowners making great profits having their wind farms, having these wind farms on their land. So these farms also create environmental impacts and as yet very few community wind farms have been established. So the artist's portrayal of wind energy is not a new phenomenon. Rembrandt, his Dutch painting compatriots, Turner and Van Gogh have all included windmills in their artworks as important landscape landmarks. I returned to live in the Highlands in the 1990s with my Australian partner, artist Ian Westacott, leaving behind an academic career in London to live near Dornoch. And my London-based friends thought I was crazy leaving my art career and vibrant art scene to return to, in their opinion, the remote and far, far away Highlands. I wanted to commit myself to living and working here for me, I'm in a perfect geographically placed area. I can look out to the sea from my house and it's far enough away from Inverness and easy access to the West, North and the Northern Isles. I also feel that there is a strong sense of community within the visual arts in the Highlands, even although practicing artists are more geographically spread out. And in many cases, we support each other it is much harder to live in a rural environment compared to an urban one, and we have to work harder to make ourselves heard on the cultural scene. And in our area, the council regional arts offices have now long gone, and we presently live in a limbo mode for the visual fine arts within the public sector. An industry doesn't sit well within the tourist lobbyist minds. It is well shut out. Yet if you drive along the A9 in Easter Ross, which is parallel to the Cromarty Firth, and walk along the Cromarty Town shoreline, this is the closest any land lubber in the UK can get to the offshore energy industry. Lines of cold and hot stacked rigs 
giant subsea jackets for the offshore wind industry at Cromarty Port Authority and Port of Nig. And it is interesting to note here that our contemporary tourist portrayal of the Highlands is still locked in 19th century tat. Landseer Sir Walter Scott and Horatio McCulloch were largely responsible for propagating this romanticised image of the Scottish Highlands, which captured the world's imagination in the latter half of the 19th century. And the legacy of these myths created still very much lives on today in the Highlands. Industry is a vital part of the Highlands social history and contemporary life. So how do we view contemporary landscape painting portrayal of present day Highlands? Consumer art or sympathetic depiction? And at the beginning of 2020, I started my Port of Neg residency. And I found myself returning to where it all started off for me, the Cromarty Firth. And this site originally was the Highland Fabricators Yard established by Brown and Root and Wimpy United States companies in 1972. And in July last year, 2021, BBC Scotland's production, Rigs of Nig, was broadcast and it really struck a chord locally. For the first time, there was a television programme dedicated to the impact that Nig fabrication had made within the Highlands. And in a way, this yard's establishment on the site is like the 1980s local hero film script with a very different ending. One and a half million cubic yards of sand and sandstone was, were bulldozed and taken away to create this yard. In the late 1970s, an oil terminal was sited next door to store crude oil arriving by subsea pipe from the Beatrice oil field. 30 miles out in the Murray Firth, ready for tanker pickup. At the same time, a $500 million oil refinery was also planned on Neg Sands east side, a vision of the reclusive US billionaire Daniel K. Ludwig. But thankfully, this didn't come to pass. And incidentally, I visited Beatrice Oil Field in 2018 just months before it was shut down and abandoned. And I am presently working on a short film with Mick O'Donnell from that trip for capturing the energy, University Aberdeen. So would it happen today? Jobs, industry, improved economics versus nature and envi environmental implications, a perpetual conundrum. I can't remember what Neg's landscape was like pre-1972, where part of this site had old First and Second World War Admiralty buildings, and this land, vast sand dunes and sandy beaches brimming with wildlife. My parents used to take the passenger boat over from Cromarty and have picnics there. Incidentally, the last remaining cottage at Neg Valvraid Cottage was bulldozed last year to make way for Global Energy Nig Yard's new East Quay. And they commissioned me to paint this cottage as a gift to its owners, part leverage in order to buy their cottage, the power of art as memory. So as I walk around Nig Yard for the last two years, there have been moments of being very aware of what had gone on before. 50 years of activity and of my own experiences here whilst drawing when I was a young art student. Almost two generations of workers have trampled this ground before. People I knew from my own childhood worked here, building massive steel platform jackets, the first being for the 40s field the first field I visited offshore. And this is where I drew in 1986-7 and returned again in 2006-7 to draw and document the Beatrice Offshore Deep Water Wind Demonstrator Project, a world's first and precursor to the £2.6 billion Beatrice Offshore Wind Farm in the Murray Firth.
My on-site visits to NEG were very spasmodic uh, due to COVID restrictions and lockdowns. And over the past two years, I've drawn the main activities on site, which were the refit of the WellSafe Guardian rig for decommissioning, the East Murray offshore wind farm components, and May Gen Atlantis underwater tidal turbine. And before COVID lockdown, I was busy drawing the WellSafe Guardian rig to get to know the crew on board whilst it was being transformed from an exploration rig into a multi-purpose installation solely for decommissioning work, cupping and well abandonment, completing the platform's end of life. And to get on board the WellSafe Guardian, one had to climb up a scaffolding stairway of 20 levels and 200 steps. So plenty of stops, admiring the view was my priority while ascending. And this site is full of industrial activity and very exposed to the elements. So to draw outside for long periods of time was potentially dangerous with very heavy vehicle activities. So I got permission to stationary position my car in good drawing spots. And I basically had the freedom of driving almost anywhere I wanted within reason, then drawing in comfort and ease. And in shop one, uh, an exciting renewable energy machine was being built, destined for Japan. The Meijin Atlantis tidal turbine, its seabed test site is located in the Pentland Firth between the island of Stroma and the Caithness coast. And witnessing and being allowed access to draw this machine was a privilege. There were exciting shapes for me to draw. Drawing this machine reminded me of test site visits to EMEC, the European Maritime Marine Energy Centre off the Orkney Isles coast. And during my time on site, the first heavy transport vessel to arrive was the Osprey, carrying eight subsea jackets from Dubai. NIG was a service point for Murray East Wind Farm, now in operation, and in total, 103 subsea jackets were brought in by sea to NIG, some by barge from Newcastle or by heavy transport vessels from Dubai. And at NIG, these jackets were offloaded, inspected, and made ready for the massive jackup crane ship, Sea Jack Scylla. And she lifted four jackets onto her deck for every sail out to the Murray Firth placing each one onto their dedicated seabed spot. And on NIG's quayside areas, many vessels docked either for refueling, change of crew, or for picking up fabricated structures for offshore. Like my watercolor sketch here, picking up the Atlantis tidal turbine. Again, being able to draw these deep water vessels on the quayside was exciting their design, colour and scale. And this reminded me of my epic voyage in June 2019 on board the largest construction vessel in the world, the Pioneering Spirit, up to the northern North Seas to lift off Brent Bravo topside by a single lift, 25,000 tonnes in nine seconds. And these are some of those quick sketches I did on board during that journey. I still have to work more on my large working drawings from that trip. So drawing from my car in, uh, inside of my car, I began to notice the seabird life unperturbed by this industrial noisy works going on. The eider ducks return every year to nest on the tiny artificial rocky sea defence shoreline surrounding part of this yard. And to my amazement, Arctic terns began to appear and nested in the yard's gravel tracks and heaps, dive bombing anyone who came near. There was about a colony of at least 200 birds. Seagulls, cormorants, and a regular visiting seal. And I was entranced by this wildlife 
and have drawn many sketches and filmed these nesting birds, and they are tiny remnants of nature clinging on. And these images will play a large part in my finished works. So as this residency comes to a close and reflection due to COVID, I felt there was a great gap, not having communicated much with the workers, fleeting conversations and figure sketches on site. And it reflected upon the global events of COVID the door slamming shut on social interaction and contact with people. But last summer I had the opportunity to spend a week on the WellSafe Guardian hot stacked in the Cromarty Firth. And this was a unique experience as I was on board along with a crew of 35, but technically not offshore. And after drawing her by Neg Keyside during the first months of my residency, I was now staying on board with strict COVID rules. And the POBs were busy servicing and commissioning all the equipment on board, preparing for their first maiden decommissioning voyage. And she sailed out last month in January to decommission uh, the honey field. So waking up to the views of looking down the Firth with all the cold and hot stacked rigs and familiar onshore landscape all around was quite something. And I hoped to board the WellSafe Protector, a jack up rig also hot stopped in the Firth, nearer to Cromarty Town and Neg this summer, and stay on board for a week before she sails out to work on decommissioning contracts. It is interesting to note that the owners of these two rigs is a new company, the only Scottish UK company to ever own which operate in the whole of the North Sea. So the death of the old ways and with the removal of oil and gas installations and the decommissioning programme will now lead to the establishment of the new with the emergence of renewable energy. And at the end of last year, Global Energy Port of NIG announced that they were going to build the UK's largest offshore wind tower factory, capable of producing up to 135 towers per year and creating more than 400 manufacturing jobs when it opens next year in 2023. And all the former Highland fabrication yards are reopening and reinventing themselves, offering facilities for decommissioning and renewables, a small resurgence. So with the Scotwind license bids, won by global corporate companies offshore, what might the future maritime landscape become? Like Doggerland? A recent fiction novel written by Ben Smith, which is set in such a future, describing the eeriness of working amongst these vast offshore energy farms. And as an artist, using traditional methods, such as plaster, paints, pencils and paper, these are fascinating, if very troubling times to be following the energy industry. It's a race against time to save our precious planet. And I think it's important to record these pioneering projects using these mediums in parallel with the official new media technology. Artists see and observe the world differently creating different outlooks and personal impressions. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you, Sue. That was absolutely terrific. Artists seeing and observing the world differently and what a wonderful presentation, very moving presentation that was. Um, greatly appreciate it. Um, I now see the time. We've got we've got an opportunity. You can see the applause on the screen, I think. Um, what I would suggest, Sue, is maybe if you try switching your camera on now. I mentioned at the start of the talk that um, we have some bandwidth issues and hopefully that will work okay. And I'm just going to see if there are any um, questions. As I said at the start of the talk, if you do have questions, you can post them in the chat or um, 
you can put up your hand or just, I think, unmute yourself. I think that would be fine. So I'm going to open up the floor now to a few questions. If you want to post one in the chat, obviously just give yourself time to type that in there. But if anybody wants to just try and unmute their mic and ask a question now, you're more than welcome. Maybe I'll get started with one for you, Sue, because I could ask 20. Um, I wondered how, and this is maybe quite a, per a personal question, it's a very personal theme, but um, do you ever feel um, inclined to write about your art before you've completed it? Or does that is that always something that follows, is it a reflective process that follows the creation of the visual art? I think uh, especially if I'm drawing offshore, um, I think they work in parallel, they work together, my notes, my diaries, and my visual sketches. Because um, my diaries, certainly my notes, uh, text notes, certainly help me, remind me of the events, the people, uh, and also uh, what, you know, the atmosphere of that day or, or that uh, moment or the what I'm drawing. Yeah, so. They work together. It just depends, really. Um, but the, the main thing is the image. Um, and for me, the, it's always important to do the sketching. Um, I certainly have backup with photography, but it's nothing like um, actually drawing what's in front of you because you're you're um, learning with your eye. You're remembering with your eye what that was. Um, the human eye is still way ahead of the, the the lens, the photographic lens, from an artist, my point of view, anyway. Mm, that's a fascinating point. Yeah, I, I guess my, I didn't word my question well. I was in, it's really interesting to hear that, about the extent to which your diaries have always been there and something that you thought other people might see. Yeah, well, I always um, thought it was, uh, well, diaries, are the, my images for me are the, the um, they work together, but the image for me are perhaps the most important because um, I'm uh, writing doesn't come easy to me. So, <laughs> yeah. nor does the art either at times, I have to say. <laughs> well, evidence suggests that both do. I can see that um, Jim Hunter has his hand up. I can't see other people. If you've got your camera off, I can't see if you've got your hand up, but I'll, I'll do my best. I'm going to go to Jim next. And we'll take it from there. Over to you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, hello, Sue. Uh, uh, that was really, really good stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, just one thought I had. Uh, you know, you're you've had now for perhaps I shouldn't say many, many years. That sounds say uh, slightly uh, insulting, but but you've oh. had this you've had this opportunity over you know, right way back to the relatively early days of the North Sea oil industry to be involved with it in a in what's clearly a very unusual, if not entirely unique way. And clearly also, well, you, you mentioned the difficulties with COVID, but you've also had the opportunity to be with the people who work in that industry. And uh, as you said yourself, what you've done is a portrayal of aspects of the highlands that generally don't feature in art at all but you've also had this opportunity to be to opportunity to be with the folk who are doing all this stuff and i just wonder if you get a sense now particularly now when or in the most recent years when i guess so many of us have come to think of big oil as a very bad thing eh, for understandable environmental reasons just how does that impact on the folk who are working in it at the the cold faces are on term, but you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're involved still in the production of oil and all of that. Yes, it's all being, a lot of it's now beginning to be decommissioned, as you said, but it's still a pretty vast industry employing an awful lot of people. And how do these folk now feel about their own careers and lives in, the, in relation to well, it's a pretty constant stream of negativity. Yeah, that's a good point, Jim. Um, 
Well, certainly, I just want to say that the workers offshore should not be condemned for the dirty fossil fuel industry. They're like the miners or the whalers that have gone on before. It's the people you don't see that are the, on the beach. There's two different worlds, workers uh, offshore and the people, the hierarchy, hierarchy um, on the beach, as they call it. But and it's uh, the irony is um, we've got Greenpeace helping the offshore workers trying to get into transition, transition of jobs. And I know uh, speaking to, um, they're mostly men, there's there's some women, maybe two or three on, on board offshore, but most of the men would love to get out of this industry if they can and get into renewables. Um, but uh, it's a long road. Um, and I don't want to get into politics here, <laughs> but um, they certainly feel that uh, they would very much like to move on. Um, but they they have families, houses, mortgages, the usual story. Uh, so they, some of them feel a bit trapped. Um, it's a very difficult life, I would say, for both their partners on um, behind at home and also uh, it's like a military style, as I've said in the talk, um, lifestyle, because they're away and it's now three weeks away offshore. Um, so it can be, uh, it's also you're never at ease, you're, you're always on standby, uh, 12 hour shift. And even if you're off shift, you're always on standby. Um, so yeah, it's it's, it's a very difficult time, I would say, for workers to keep going. Um, yeah. That's I don't bad. know if I answered your question. Okay, yeah. okay uh, we'll maybe come back to that. Thanks. I don't mean yeah. to cut Jim off there, but a really excellent answer. Um, mm -hmm. Kathy Miles Grant, I saw you had your hand up, so sorry about that. If you'd like to come in, here's your chance. Oh, we can't hear you, I'm afraid. Yeah. Maybe if you could write it in the chat, we can relay it to Sue that way. Sue, I'm just seeing some comments in the chat as well. Aileen Harley, sorry to have to go. Really interesting topic in artwork. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Anybody want to just come in while um, Kathy is writing hers? Oh, she can't turn on her microphone. You could write. Yeah. If you could just write it, then oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, David. Ah, Jim. Okay, right, it's Jim, it's Jim here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. I th I th thanks very much, Sue Jane. I, your comments about the wildlife reminded me something quite interesting. Uh, some years ago now, I was up at Sulem Vaux oh, yes. in Shetland, and people in Lerwick were saying, We haven't seen any terns coming this year, you know. And then we went up to Sulem Vaux and they were all nesting inside the oil terminal. Yeah, uh, they love the gravel. <laughs> presumably, uh, you know, the security was very high there and maybe they felt safer than they would in the open moorland or the open beach. So it's quite interesting how wildlife actually does adapt to these things. Not all of it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Uh, yep. But it's it's just worth bearing that in mind, yeah, and I could add, I could add as well that all the sea uh, the wind turbine jackets out in the Murray Firth actually produce refuges where fish can escape from the trawlers, which is also an interesting thing. But anyway, okay, that's enough from me now. Thanks. I'll see you sometime. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, Jim's made an important point about offshore, about the certainly the, the wind farms, because the, the fishing boats are not allowed to go amongst uh, the, the farms. So therefore, they, it's like the oil platforms, they become a reef um, and a, a kind of area where the, the marine life can go, uh, especially the fish. Um, and it's also interesting about the Arctic terns, um, they love the gravel, and it's extraordinary just to see them um, 
nesting on right in the middle of this industrial activity with huge um, uh, vehicles going past and they weren't at all, and, well, in a sense, uh, d disturbed by it, thinking on their nest just on the gravel ground there. Um, obviously, th these terns have come to that area um, for maybe thousands of years, you know, um, uh, and why should they stop? But it's, it's a tricky one um, because they're being edged out, um, but anyway. Yeah, you, you mentioned alien beasts at the start of your talk. They're, they're certainly not alien beasts. <laughs> no. Um, I've just, I can see Kathy's question now, so I'm just going to read that out. I, actually, I got an option oh. to unmute. It finally, oh. it finally okay. appeared. I'm, I'm not sure. I'd like to um, just fire away then, just verbalize sure, your question. Sure. Um, just before what I wrote in the chat, one of the things I'm so struck by, Sue, is how uh, your art as a medium gives a a way to look at those structures in a in a non non-judgmental way there's something that comes through in your art and in your speaking of the 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 power and beauty of those and there's also this cumulative um sort of devastating sense of of what all of that means um and then, and then you you have shifted more recently to include a focus um, centering in on the the people working within those. And I'm just wondering. I know from reading some some of what you've written in the past that you've been attending to the people all along, but they have figured in the very small places within your art before. So I'm just wondering. What um, in what ways that current focus affects what you perceive, what you're learning? Yep, I suppose as I get older, um, I'm more reflective on on my work, and uh, people have always been important uh, for me, uh, and I've become more and more almost obsessed about the kind of PPE. Uh, you know the the the, the um, work wear that these people uh, um, also it's a, a great way of getting to know people because if they stand for you for half an hour, they're willing to chat away um, and just to make them at ease. So they'll tell you um, about their lives, about their working, what they do. You know, so it's a fascinating way of understanding a site understanding and uh, the installation um and and what and also what the um the industrial activity what the work is about as well because it can be quite complex uh, these engineering um of these huge objects you know what their purpose is and their the you know um so it's it's a great way in when you're drawing someone um because you're you're gaining knowledge inside knowledge really and that's what i missed uh, you know during covid particularly i felt very isolated uh, just in my car on my own <laughs> um and just seeing people fleetingly because uh, you had to keep in your own bubble uh, but i was uh, very fortunate to be allowed on site at all so um um, you know, but it's still that 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 communication, people contact. It's that's what makes a place uh, in anything in any life. It's the people, and certainly offshore on our installation. Um, that's how you get to know it as well. You get to uh, speak to the the um, people on board, the POBs, and that's how you understand the installation more. And it really helps. Uh, my work, my visual work, uh, and that understanding. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody want to come in with a question? I wanted to ask you then about your own history, and that came through so powerfully. And I wondered if you thought that 
there's a history of the Highlands, which is a, a North Sea history, and it sometimes gets forgotten. Is that a reasonable point? Yes, that's that's very true, especially the Highlands. It's all about the land, not uh, quite a lot, and not about the, the sea. Um, I, you know, when I was growing up, I was quite very aware of, of um, uh, for example, the Och, the the uh, village next to Munlochy, um, east of Munlochy, they had a very healthy fishing fleet at, when I was young, and um, there used to be all the fishing boats was in the harbour and a lot of herring, um, and uh, so that that was fascinating too, uh, seeing that as well, um, the the sea aspect of it. Thanks. It's, it's something I've thought about in my own work a lot in the 16th and 17th centuries that it's, it comes across quite powerfully in, in a lot of the sources I look at. So thank you for that. <coughs> Any other questions before we wrap things up? Somebody was wanting to come in. <coughs> Here's somebody coughing, but no questions coming. There's one in the chat. There's a comment. Quite a lengthy comment, so I'm just going to try to get to the top. Oh, it's from Jim. Excellent. Um, I don't know if you can see it, Sue, but I'll I'll read it out since Jim hasn't verbalised yeah. it. Your, your work has an incredibly striking quality. As someone who is trying to improve my skills, oh, hang on, I've just slipped on that. Um, sorry. Uh, it would be wonderful to know a little about your approach to colour and mediums. Also, my dad is a mechanic and scrap merchant in an industry that is slowly fading out. Mechanical. Mechanical know how being replaced by diagnostic tools. I've always thought there was something fascinating about the car stacked up in all the spare parts, broken glass, and puddles of oil. You've inspired me to try to capture a wee bit of this. I might start with sketching his hands forever covered in engine oil. Thank you. <laughs> well mm -hmm. done, Jim. Don't think it's Jim, there. actually. I've, I've got the name Is wrong, it? but I'll, I'll go back oh, to it. Oh, okay. Roxanne. Oh, yep. I can see some of the. Yeah. I'm terribly sorry. It's Jill Hunter. My my mistake Jill entirely. Hunter. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I Jim can get his this, I should say that this hunter can't draw anything, so it certainly wasn't me. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for that correction, Jim. Okay. Thanks, Jill. That's a really interesting comment. And then there's a comment from Roxanne. Thanks very much. It's been very interesting. I'm especially interested in the link you're making between the oil and wind energies. Yes, absolutely. And you would, mm -hmm. could never have predicted that at the start of your research. Is it something you were conscious about when you first started working on renew renewables, Sue, or was it just that you were gravitating to that because of your interest? Yeah, I never know what's coming up, really. I mean, it's just grown organically. I never knew I would be working on this, you know, subject on and off for the past. It's nearly 40 years, actually, since I was, yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Um, I don't know what comes next. That's the, the sort of how the artist works in a way, the visual artist. Okay, any other questions? We'll maybe just give people a chance. I know it's slightly awkward switching on your mic, but I'll just give people a chance if anybody wants to come in with a last question. Okay. Um, Nobody asked about your backdrop, Sue. Um, that was a shame. All right. <laughs> Would have been interesting. Yeah. Anyway, no, um, that was terrific. Thank you so much. And um, really enriching, important talk. And I was just struck by the way you, this mix of the mechanical and the human and nature and in different forms and different shapes and different amounts, that seems to always come up in your work. And it's very moving. And I find it really, really important. Um, and also, I think you've you've helped us as historians get a picture of your location, both from onshore and offshore. And I think that's not often seen. It was absolutely fascinating, hugely revealing presentation. So many thanks from all of us, I think. Thank you very much, all of you attending. Thank you. Okay, that's terrific. And um, unfortunately, we can't mark it in any other way than online. But uh, we have other events coming up at the Centre for History, a couple of roundtables and some other talks before we finish up this academic year. So 
I was going to say watch this space, but it's not this space. We will be in touch about that and confirm the details in due course. But we hope to have a recording up of this lecture. So if you know anybody that couldn't come along and would like to watch it, please look out for the URL, the website for the recording, and watch it back yourself. I think I might do that so I can enjoy mm. it myself rather than uh, just be shifting the slides. Okay, so thank you everybody and enjoy the rest of your evening and bye for now. <laughs> thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye -bye.